Hello and welcome back to another bike ride review from bikeride.com. I'm your host Scott and today we're looking at a bike that has some serious attitude. Psy Rusher has a unique look to its e-bikes with a variety of frame styles and bright colors. The XF900 is no exception, standing out from the lineup with its motocross inspired looks. The XF900 is a 750 watt e-bike that claims to be big on power and performance. So let's get out in the dirt and see what this e-bike can do. We're going to get right into this review, but while the intro rolls, if you like this content and love the channel, please give me a like and subscribe and make sure to turn on notifications as we have some really cool e-bikes coming in the near future. Now let's get out and ride some bikes. So what is the Psy Rusher XF900? Well, it's a large e-bike inspired by motocross bikes and it features a dual crown suspension fork and rear suspension, which when combined with the large tires, give it that moto inspired style. The bike uses a 750 watt Buffung motor for power and it's a motor capable of accelerating the bike up to 28 miles per hour with pedal assist or over 20 miles per hour with the throttle alone. It's a full suspension bike which features primarily budget parts, all the way from the suspension components to the Shimano drivetrain. These items offer limited performance and function beyond recreational riding. So it kind of affected my first impressions. The bike really feels quite similar to many budget full suspension bikes that you would find in a big box store which is to say that it's kind of clunky and unresponsive over most terrain. The bike is quick under power, and with the suspension helping to smooth out smaller bumps, it's good, but its limits are found quickly, and its performance is rough and loud. Our first pro for the bike is the 750 watt motor. The 750 watt Buffung motor on the unit is responsive and capable and it can power the bike along at over 20 miles per hour using only the motor. It puts out 1000 watts and 80 newton meters at peak output, which is more than enough for climbing hills and saving your legs the effort. The large bike benefits from the powerful motor when it comes to performance, but it can be power hungry on the battery when you're using high assist levels. The battery meter on the unit responds to the use of the motor almost immediately, dropping battery bars under any strain. This was an interesting feature on the bike and it caused some range anxiety right off the bat for our range test. Our second pro for the bike is the fact that this is a full suspension bike. The XF900 really benefits from that large dual crown suspension fork and rear suspension, despite the fact that these are both budget items, which don't really offer much adjustability or extreme performance. The suspension is sufficient, however, for smoothing out bumps in forest service roads or access roads, as well as small curbs and bumps when you're out riding in urban environments. When you start pushing the limits, the suspension feels clunky and unresponsive. As I rode over rocks and roots, the suspension clunked and rebounded harshly, causing a lot of noise and discomfort. So it's not really meant for much past recreational riding, it would seem, but it is definitely better than having no suspension in most recreational riding situations. And now taking a look at the cons. Our first con for the XF900 is the fact that this is a pretty clunky bike. The bike's style inspires it to be ridden off road. But as soon as you start to venture away from smooth terrain, you're going to notice some uncomfortable noises. And I found the XF900 to be a very clunky bike with many of these sounds emanating from the suspension and the fenders as you rode over any kind of uneven ground. The suspension clunks and clacks as the front and rear wheels impact rocks, roots, or dips. And the suspension is just in general very loud and unresponsive. Then the fenders clank and clack as impacts as you ride. Despite tightening and adjustment, they just seem to move around. And finally, the chain slaps away over any kind of bump, adding to the symphony of noises. The sounds and vibrations don't feel confidence inspiring. So if longevity is high on your list of needs and you're planning on riding this off-road regularly, I would probably dedicate this bike to a more recreational role. 
When riding the bike on more mellow terrain, the budget suspension could react and handle the smoother impacts a little better, which resulted in a more enjoyable ride quality at slower speeds on more gentle terrain. Our second con for the unit is battery level fluctuation. So the battery level indicator on our unit was very responsive to power output. During our first range test, I actually pushed the throttle to the max and watched the battery level dip all the way from five to two bars on the display. As I let off the throttle, it let back up to five. So whether you're using throttle or pedal assist, when you start to apply power and the motor kicks in, the battery indicator would react and drop bars, not offering an accurate indication of the remaining battery level until you actually stop using the motor. As the voltage level dropped over the course of our test, the display eventually gave me a low battery warning in the form of a single flashing battery bar. It started going from five to two bars, then five to one bar, and finally five to one flashing bar. And then it continued to operate at reduced speeds for about 10 minutes after this low battery warning until the battery was completely discharged. So the discharge over our range test was definitely consistent with a suitable warning before it died. But it was weird that they had this feature where the level would literally go back and forth under battery strain, which kind of made it challenging to gauge the battery level without having experience with the bike. You could only reliably read the battery level when the motor was not powering the bike. And our third con is the ride quality. It was a little bit less enjoyable than I'd previously hoped looking at the bike. The bike's front fork has a very steep vertical angle and it would benefit from a more slack head tube. As a result of this, the bike really pulls the rider over the front wheel, which is kind of uncomfortable on turns and descents, and it limits the bike's ability in different terrain. The drivetrain on the bike is also a little bit limited, which really leaves you ghost pedaling at high speeds. So overall, the bike kind of felt inexpensive and ill-fitting. While I enjoyed certain aspects, such as the large motor, Lots of the small details made me feel like the bike lacked value in some areas compared to its price. So what does it do best? The Psy Rusher's unique styling will attract some users rather than others. The bike itself could definitely be used for recreational riding or light off-road riding. It has a sizable rear rack, which allows it to transport items. And it could also be used by someone looking to fish or hunt small game. The bike would also be probably of good use for younger riders like teens, though its size would limit its use for smaller individuals, as it only fits users taller than 5 foot 9 inches. And its motorcycle styling and large 750 watt motor make for an interesting riding experience, allowing it to power the user over 20 miles per hour with throttle only. So what are some reasons to look elsewhere? The XF900 is a large e-bike that is not intended for riders shorter than 5'9". So height is a limiting factor with the bike, excluding shorter riders. Some other users are really not going to enjoy the style of the bike, with large tires and a motocross-inspired front fork. This extends the turn radius and can make maneuvering the bike a little bit tough in smaller spaces. The size of the bike also makes it hard to lift or move it upstairs. So storage is going to be a problem if you don't have a ground level garage available. Bringing it inside a lift or upstairs would be very challenging. Moving into the frame and geometry of this bike. The XF900 is a large bike which is designed for taller riders with a minimum recommended rider height of 5 foot 9 inches. It's not suitable for smaller people. The bike features a full suspension setup, which includes lower end coil suspension components. The result is a clunky and unresponsive ride quality over anything but mild terrain. And the bike definitely pulls the rider forward during turns or descents, due to the angle and placement of its head tube and front wheel, making the bike feel more suited for recreational riding. This bike comes in at a total of 76 pounds, so it's a little bit heavy to ride and lift, but it's not as heavy as some other bikes that we've seen in this full suspension setup. Taking a look at the measurements on this unit, we have a seat tube measurement of 18 inches, a reach measurement of 19 inches, a stack measurement of 24.5 inches, 
a stand over height of 36 inches, a virtual top tube length of 25.5 inches, minimum saddle height of 34.6 inches, and a max saddle height of 47.2 inches, with a total wheelbase of 47.2 inches. And this gives us a recommended rider height of five feet, nine inches to six feet, four inches. And the bike weighs in total 76 pounds. Looking at the motor, the XF900 features a Bafung 750 watt motor, which is capable of a thousand watts at peak output. This is enough to push you up most hills with limited effort, and it gives off 80 newton meters of max torque. The throttle can also power you past 20 miles per hour, allowing you to use the bike without needing to pedal. Despite being a 750 watt motor, the programming of the controller on this unit was a little bit slower to accelerate than others. So some users are gonna enjoy this slower ramp up and speed, which can make the bike feel more controllable. It took about 10 to 13 seconds to reach 20 miles per hour, whether you were using that pedal assist or you were using just the throttle. So it was quite controlled and steady to accelerate. Our test unit was power hungry though, as the battery seemed to take a large dip in power each time we used the throttle, dropping from full to two bars as soon as we would engage that twist style throttle. The motor was definitely taxing the battery heavily, as we only got a total range of just over 21 miles using the maximum assist level. During our acceleration test, we managed to get a total of 12 seconds using throttle only and 10 seconds using the maximum pedal assist. Cockpit and control. A large black and white backlit display takes center stage with this bike. And it's a high contrast display, which is easy to see. And it has some nice additional features like a live power meter, which shows your current power output in Watts. The bike is controlled by two small control pads on the left side. The five button layout has a dedicated light button as well as a horn for interacting with other road users. The controls are easy to use with a standard button set up to move through display options and change pedal assist levels. And it consists of an up button, down button, and an options button. When it comes to the battery, we have a 17 amp hour, 48 volt battery, which powers this 750 watt motor. And I was surprised by the results of our range test as the battery did not perform as well as I had hoped based on this size. At 17 amp hours, it should be reasonable, but a range of just over 20 miles was pretty short for that 816 watt hour battery. What it did offer was consistent performance throughout the test, despite the fact that it was showing a significant impact on the battery while under strain. The battery did taper consistently, offering the same level of assist until it hit its low battery warning. And after that last bar began to flash, you could feel the motor providing less power. The battery continued to operate for about 10 minutes after this low battery warning until it was finally completely dead. So the total distance in our range test was 21.5 miles with 922 feet of elevation gain over one hour and 28 minutes with an average speed of 14.5 miles per hour, which as you can see is a little bit shorter than the typical average that we would expect for batteries in the 17 amp hour range with most of our results going over 25 miles. Charger, battery removal, and keys. The battery for this bike is externally mounted and it recharges using a 54.6 volt, two amp output charger. It's gonna take you over eight hours to fully recharge the battery. The charger plugs into the same slot on the side of the battery when it's charging, whether it's mounted to the bike or it's off the bike. And the charge slot is covered by a rotating cover. The battery can also be removed by inserting the key into the hole on the battery pack side. Turning the key unlocks the battery, which can then be removed with a good tug upwards. Sometimes the battery could get a little stuck and require a little bit of force to get it moving. Reinserting it is just the reverse. Just make sure to line up the plastic rails with the areas on the rear of the battery before reinserting it. After it's back in the bike, you can lock it onto the frame with the same key or it slides and locks in place. The XF900 drivetrain includes a very large 52 tooth crankset. It also features a double-sided guard to protect your clothes when you're out riding it. 
It's a seven speed drivetrain, which uses a 14 to 28 tooth cassette. This reveals the cause of our ghost pedaling, as we've mentioned previously. The lack of range and gearing means users are gonna be along for the ride at higher speeds. It uses a shifter from Shimano, which is a trigger shifter slung under the bars. And it offers a minor upgrade over a TX50 overhand shifter, both in terms of performance and aesthetics, with a little bit of a cleaner shifting feel. As we get down to the brakes, we can see that we have a set of Zoom dual piston hydraulic brakes on the XF900. These feature aluminum levers and 180 millimeter rotors, both front and rear. The stopping power is adequate and the performance matches other bikes during testing. And the brakes are pretty pleasant to use. They have a nice lever feel. However, we have had a few issues with Zoom brakes in the past, with them either needing frequent service or possibly having a little bit of issue with the levers getting bent if they're bumped or the bike happens to fall over. They seem to be made of a very soft aluminum. In our braking test, the XF900 managed to stop in a total distance of 19.5 feet. Wheels, tires, and fenders. The XF900 maintains its Moto-inspired styling with a large set of 26 by 4 inch tires and wheels. These large wheels assist in traveling over loose terrain and maintaining traction. And the tires are from a producer, Chao Yang, featuring a more aggressive mountain style tread pattern. They proved themselves during our stopping test, as well as riding over dirt, gravel, and different terrain like rocks and roots. The bike also comes equipped with fenders on both the front and rear. And these are made from hard plastic. And they do like to bump and make noise as you ride. So I personally found the fenders a little bit annoying as I rode my local trails, finding that they would bump and bang around. But they did do a good job keeping me clean from water and mud. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 here. The bike features a set of brake inhibitors on both brake levers, which ensure that the motor is cut off immediately when you're stopping. And on this XF900 model, we also have a 250 lumen front headlight, as well as an external battery operated rear facing light, which is not integrated into the bike's electronics. Looking at the contact points on the XF900, we start off with the grips. And these grips on the bike are a hard plastic, which is integrated into that twist style throttle on the right side. I was not a fan of the feeling of these hard plastic grips under hand, and I would definitely prefer something different like a nice rubber grip or a lock-on grip. The saddle on the bike is listed as an ergonomic, athletic, or sport style saddle with lots of cushioning. It's a larger seat than most of these sport style seats that we see, but it does fall short of one of those huge plush cushion seats that we see on the cruiser style bikes. So it didn't inhibit pedaling and it was comfortable. After 20 plus miles in the saddle, I wasn't complaining much. The saddle also has a battery operated rear facing light, which is integrated into the design of the saddle and it's turned off using a button on the bottom of the light. The pedals are a flat alloy pedal, which is similar to a Welgo platform pedal. They have similar small alloy studs and provide reasonable traction. As a standard item, it's pretty typical of all e-bikes and it's gonna get you out and biking. The XF900 from Psy Rusher is a full suspension bike with a very unique style. And it's sure to turn some heads when you're out on the road. The bike's performance was a little disappointing though, with some clunky budget components, such as that front fork, rear shock, and a budget drivetrain that really left the user along for the ride at high speeds. The XF900 seems like a good fit for those searching for a budget full suspension bike, capable of traveling away from the pavement for some recreational riding and light off-road fun. Is this bike for you? Check out the detailed specs at bikeride.com and see user and expert reviews. You can also check out other great e-bikes and see them rated to find your perfect match. Do you have a question or something you wanna say? Let me know in the comments and we'll start getting you some answers. If you like this video, give us a like and subscribe so we can keep on bringing you the latest e-bike reviews and news. I'm Scott with bikeride.com. Thanks for watching and I hope that you enjoy the ride.